<clears throat> Alrighty guys, today we're talking intro to role playing. Now I'm using Dungeons and Dragons as an example, though this could really be used for like just about any role playing game. And this is for if you are on the like newer side of role playing, either like, you know, you're still getting it under your belt and or you are like entirely new and all you know is that there's like a guy called the DM, the dungeon master, who sort of is like telling the story and you guys are all characters in that story and you roll dice to determine whether or not things happen. Uh, so hopefully I can, you know, show you a few things to help you out on your journey of rolling or learning how to role play. Okay. So, stop right there. So if you are entirely new to Dungeons and Dragons and role playing, don't let me corrupt your mind and ruin you with my like thoughts and what I think that a proper role player should look like because there's something truly like beautiful and wonderful when someone has no idea what like role playing is and like what they're allowed to do and what they can and cannot do and you just set them loose in this world and you tell them like hey you can do whatever you want there there's no rules whatever you could do in real life you can do in this game and some like truly beautiful creative moments can come out of that when they are entirely like uh, <clears throat> un you know uncorrupted by all these like outside influences so, you know, this, only watch the rest of this if you are a, like, severe over-preparer and you really do not even want to risk, like, possibly messing up playing your Dungeons & Dragons because the rest of this lecture and lesson is just going to teach you how to be a robot and turn everything into a flowchart of, like, if this, then this. If that, then this. Okay, so fair warning out of the way. General session autopsy. So this is what the general breakdown of like an average session of Dungeons and Dragons looks like. You'll start with some like pre-game chit chat. I should also mention every single table is different. Every single DM is different. Every game every group all different so this is like just general rules of thumb by no means like a strict axiom for every single session to ever occur uh, so the pre-game chit chat this is like usually anywhere from 15 30 minutes people will discuss things outside of the game how what's their food plan you know i've been up to this and that and i watched this movie and get all that all that talk out of the way before the game so you don't think about it in the game and then feel the need to like you know distract and interrupt during the game okay after that you'll you, know, you will start to like get into things if it's the first session of the campaign and the dm will usually like explain an intro like the the world and this is banana virus and there are dragons and they are at war with the goblins and it is a very dark and sad time right now or if this is like a later session then there might be like a recap of what happened in the previous session and then the dm will likely set you guys up in a situation you, know, you guys all meet at the Banana Monkey Tavern, and you guys are all sitting around at the table. What do you want to do? And at this point, you you will be like looking around and either waiting for someone else to say something, and or thinking to yourself like, uh, okay, so like I don't know what what am I supposed to do? Drink? Wait until someone does something? I don't know. Hopefully, the rest of this lesson and slideshow will teach you generally how you can or what you should respond with when asked what do you do that's that's the, like the core gameplay loop is the dm asking what do you do and then you responding with how how you what you want to do okay and then this is just going to get repeated over and over and over and over and over 
Sometimes there might be a situation where you attack someone or someone attacks you. You might get a bunch of little plastic figurines, especially if you're playing D&D &D and not some other role-playing game. And, you know, you might start moving these little figurines and rolling dice and saying, like, I stabbed this guy and he stabbed me and numbers and math and yada yada. And at some point, you will reach the end of a session. You know, a couple hours will pass. And the DM will find a spot that he thinks is appropriate for wrapping up. And you will come to a conclusion, and the session will be over, and then everyone goes home. Okay. Uh, that's, you know, general session breakdown for you. Okay. So what about my character? I imagine this whole character thing is very important, if that's the whole point of the game, is that I'm taking this role and playing him. Now, I know some people, their initial inclination may be to, you know, I, I want to play my own original OC. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to just play some guy that, like, you know, someone else came up with. But generally, the DM will have these things prepared called pre-generated characters. And, and, you know, they're just characters that the DM has already written for and made everything for uh and you know so you, so you might want to think to yourself like yeah like obviously i don't i don't want to play ragdar like who wants to be ragdar like I, I want to be my own cool minotaur wizard or something but if you want to play the minotaur wizard you are going to have to fill out this horrific nightmare this kafka-esque bureaucratic signed in triplicate form and if you don't know what you're doing it is going to take multiple hours plus and so if you're the type of person to sit here and watch an hour-long video about how to role play then maybe you're also the kind of person to sit down and want to do uh, like a whole lot of basic math and a whole lot of reading to make your minotaur wizard guy uh, but I would, like, generally steer away from that. And you know, once you know how to make a character, it's really not that bad. There's, like, some very basic math you have to do, and then you're going to make, like, five choices, and that's going to be everything you need to do for your character. The other problem is that each one of these choices has, like, ten options, so if you want to, if you don't have an exact mind of like, I want to be an elf ranger with like this longbow kind of build, if you don't know like exactly what you want to do, it is going to take forever if you end up having to read through options, because every single option, it's, it's not just elf, dwarf, halfling, they each have their own paragraph and multiple, multiple abilities as to what each of these things do. So it's just a it's, it's a whole whole lot of work, and you'll you'll also set yourself up for this mindset where you look at your character from the perspective of all this like math and abilities and all this stuff, rather than from just like being handed a lens a perspective through which you will experience and see this world. Now, so okay. You, you might be thinking, like, fine, I'll, I'll take Regdar, but, like, I, I don't want to be this, like, brave, good hero guy. Like, who wants to be Regdar? Uh, you know, I, I want to not be a brave I, I want to be this sniveling, evil coward. Well, that's where, like, you know, if you have that creative energy, if you're, like, if you want to flex on everyone else with your character development writing and storytelling skills then you know you, you can just like interpret this little blurb about the character however you want you know it's like a, a bible or something like uh just you know who's to say that this that Rigdar doesn't have a pr team that's very excellent and in reality in truth he is a sniveling coward but this is a little blurb that is that Regdar wrote about how he's a great hero. And or how do you know that this is not written by his fan club who 
they all think Ragdar is a really great guy because he has this really great propaganda machine behind him. Uh, when in reality, you know, he's like some sniveling coward. Like, uh, how, how do you know? You know, nowhere here does it definitively say this was written by an omniscient, you know, mega god machine or whatever. Uh, and just uh, look at how simple and beautiful and easily interpretable this character sheet is versus this horrifying bureaucratic nightmare. So if you're on the fence about whether or not you want to try making your own guy or if you just want to play a guy that the DM already has ready, I would highly recommend that you just give the already made guy a shot. And, you know, for a long time, I was anti, anti pregen because obviously I would think that, like, okay, I'm going to have more of a connection if I make my own guy. Like, that is, just, like, if I spent an hour creating and writing down this guy, that's, like, at least an hour's worth of connection I already have to this, you know, character that I just wrote. When in reality, your connection, your ability to care and sympathize and, like, uh, you know, connect with the character really does not come down to whether or not you wrote anything at all for them. It's really just whether or not you decide to care, whether or not you are willing to put yourself out there in a, in a position to care about the character. I've seen many, many times people put very, very long, effortful hours into creating and perfecting their character, and then as soon as the game starts, they play this character the exact same as they would play any other character. And I've seen the complete opposite, where people just like pick up a sheet and then they just start rolling with it, and it's just like they, they instantly are that character. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't feel like that spending hours in writing your character gives you any more than of a connection to them. It's, it's really just a thing you you are willing to do. Uh, okay, so that's pre-gens. Okay, so how to interact with the world. So generally, you will... Uh, you will... Everything you say will be... Uh, in present tense, you will refer to yourself in the first person. That's like the general rule of thumb as to how to like state your interactions and what you would like to do. And usually it is in the form of either, I want to try to do this. Can I try to do this? Like, I want to climb up this tree. I want to try to cut off this troll's leg. I want to try to throw my sword at the dragon's wing. I want to cut this goblin's head off, and then, you know, so you're going to say what you're going to try to do, and then your DM is going to tell you, like, okay, roll this dice, add this number from your character sheet, and if you get this result, then you succeed. And the other main way they're going to interact with the world is through questions. This is going to be how you learn about, like, what's around you, what's going on, you're going to ask the DM, like, what can I see? You know, what, what does my character, you know, what do I see? What do I, like, what, what does it smell like? What, you know, what, what, what hat is he, this guy wearing? What, what's this? What's that? Just, like, these are going to be your two main tools in playing the game. Just, like, I want to try to do this, and what does X look like? And if you have an intention... You know, be clear and state it. If you are asking the DM, like, if you have in your mind, like, okay, cool, so I want to, like, go to a potion shop and, like, buy potions. And if you get this point across by asking the DM, like, hey, so what kind of buildings are there in this town? And then the DM lists off a bunch of buildings, and then you say afterwards, like, oh, so there's no alchemist shop, no, no place I can get potions at? You know, if, if that's what your intention is, then just lead off with that. Just start off by asking the DM, like, is there an alchemist shop or is there, like, a place I can get potions in this town? You know, you, you want to try to waste time and ask, like, 
questions that you don't care about the answer to as little as possible, you know? Uh, like, take effort to ask good, meaningful questions, if you can. And like, if you are just genuinely curious and you have no, like, active lead or, like, active idea as to what you're going to do with this information and you're just trying to get the DM to list off some stuff for you to possibly, like, riff off of, then that's okay, too. Just... Know why you are asking a question, and then ask the appropriate question to suit your purpose. Okay. Now, can't I just, like, do stuff? Do I have to roll for everything? Do I have to ask if I can do every single thing? Uh, generally, my, like, rule of thumb is, like, if you are... You know, the 95-95 the rule is what I call it. If, like, 95% of the population could, like, do this, like, 95% of the time without a problem, you probably you don't have to bother asking your DM. If you can do it, you just can do it. Like, if you're climbing up a ladder, if you are petting a dog, opening a regular door, or... And, you, you know, know every, every once in a while, while this will lead to, like, a situation where you actually can't just do it. You're going to try to say, like, all right, I'm going to run up the stairs and try to chase this guy. And then the DM will actually will tell you, like, well, these aren't just regular stairs. These are, you know, these are goblin-built castle stairs, and they're actually very rickety and hard to run up. And... Uh, you know, so there will be like a moment of confusion, or not a moment of confusion, but like a moment of like stop, back it up, like you can't just do this, you have to roll for it. But like for how rare it is going to be that that happens, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't have to set up this situation where you have to ask, can I do this, wait for a DM answer, and then go on with what you're going to do, uh, if it is like a simple, straightforward thing. And in addition to this, if a thing would likely exist within the context, like 95% of the time, then you can usually just assume that it is there. Like, if you are, like, in a tavern, you can probably just assume that there are stools around, even if you're the DM doesn't, like, explicitly state that there are stools there, because, you know, people are just sitting on stuff. So... I wouldn't ask, like, if you were in a tavern brawl, I, I wouldn't set up a situation or, like, set up, like, a line of questions where you ask, like, okay, I want to look around. Like, are there any stools? And then the DM is like, yes, there are stools. And like, okay, uh, can I try to, like, pick up a stool? And then the DM will say, like, yeah, sure, you can pick up a stool. And then you, you might ask, like, okay, so now I want to try to take the stool and throw it at another guy who's fighting the barbarian. Uh, you know, they... they you don't have to ask those first couple of questions. Just, like, assume that stools are there. Assume that you can pick up stools if you're, like, an average, healthy human adult uh, of, like, not, like, horrific, debilitated strength or something. Just go straight to, like, okay, I want to pick up a stool and throw it at this guy. And then the DM will just tell you to roll. Uh, you know, so cut off the trimmings wherever you think you can. Try to bring down your questions to as simple and as, like, one sentence of a question you possibly can. Uh, just, you know, really try to be brief with your questions when you can. Uh, try to waste as little time as possible. Okay. Declarations and dialogue. So 50% of the game is going to be, uh, you know, rolling dice and playing a board game, basically. And then the other, like, 50% of the game is going to be, like, this improv theater, you know, talking back and forth with dialogue and all that jazz. So how do you actually, like, form this dialogue? Well, here's, like, my general sort of little... Uh, formula, if you will. So, if you were trying to, like, engage in dialogue, then I would usually lead it up with an action. Like, like, like in a screenplay, the, like, action line. You say what your character is literally physically doing within the world, and say, like, okay, I want to walk up to the barkeep and say, hi, my name is Glenn Zigzerar. Do you have any male, uh, you know, escorts for sale or something? I don't know. Okay, so, uh, and or, 
if someone commences a dialogue with you, you probably don't need to like have any sort of action line. You can just jump right into dialogue, go into your character voice, and respond. Uh, action. This can also happen like in between. Like if if you want to, if you guys have just been going back and forth for a while, and you want to add some like movement into the scene. You might specify, like, okay, I want to grab onto the barkeep's collar and shake him and scream, I don't like you because of how you look. Whatever. Okay. And then you're going to... You can also use action to, like, end the dialogue and say, like, huh, well, I don't care what you have to say. And then I get up and walk away and out the door. Uh, so, that's, so that's, like, how you can use action in, in, in or after your dialogue. Okay, adverbly. So, uh, okay, if you're not 100% convinced that what you are about to say is going to come across, and or if the matter in how you say it is the important part, then you can use like an adverb to help you out. So you might say like, uh, mockingly, insultingly, I tell him, I tell the bugbear, like, oh, that's quite a bold choice you have on for pants today. And, you know, because the point there is you're trying to, like, make fun of him. Alternatively, you might say, like, oh, flirtingly, I say, oh, bugbear, that's quite the choice of pants you have on today. You know, so both like the same thing is being said both times, but they have drastically different meanings based on that adverb you added at the beginning. Uh, so yeah, if, if you're not convinced in your ability to get what the like message, the tone of what you're trying to say, uh, just cheat, just say the adverb uh, so that people can both, you know, when, when you're saying the thing, they will know. Uh, like what context to be listening to what you're saying in and then they can start formulating their response as you say it okay and dialogue very often or uh, i don't know about very often but like occasionally you will start saying something and then just like the michael scott like uh, sometimes i just start saying a sentence i don't even know where it's going you know, you, you'll start saying something and then just not know where it's going. And you'll start either rambling or stumbling or trailing off. And in those situations, it's important to just, like, give up on what you're trying to say. Just, like, if you feel yourself starting to lose it, just stop what you're trying to say. And then just go to the, what I'm trying to say is... Fuck you. What I'm trying to say is, I really like you. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think you should be doing that. You know, because sometimes there's so many different little names and th different things and details to remember that as you're trying to talk and then remember all these different details, they'll all just start getting lost in your mind. So it's clear is that everyone gets the point of what you're trying to say. Everything you know this is in bold because it's very important everything is about maximizing flow and minimizing ambiguity everything you say should serve the continuation of the scene continuation of the dialogue and do everything you can to be brief and clear because as soon as ambiguity starts building up then eventually you're going to hit a point where someone says like, wait, 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 what's going on? Can someone, can someone, can we stop this for a moment? And like, can someone explain to me what is happening? Like it is pretty much guaranteed that that is going to happen, but you really want to try to prevent that from happening at all costs. Yeah. Just like, keep in mind with every single dialogue and action you take, Maximize flow, minimize ambiguity. Okay, do I have to talk in a silly voice? The short answer is yes. And I, you know, but Joe, I'm socially anxious and talking in this character voice makes me feel uncomfortable and uh, you are, look, you're, you're playing the wrong game then. This is literally about sitting around a table and pretending to be an elf or a dwarf. The game is already, like, silly and awkward and uncomfortable. 
just embrace it. Don't try to like skirt around the fact that you guys are all sitting around the table pretending to be elves and dwarves and silly fairies and dragons and nonsense. Like like the game is inherently silly. Just embrace it. Don't don't try to you know use little tactics to like prevent yourself from coming across as silly in this game. And also, having a silly voice serves a functional, practical purpose. When you talk in a silly voice, then everyone at the table immediately knows, okay, so this is being said in character, and then if you're not saying something in character, then you just talk with your regular voice. And so you you are preserving flow, you are embracing flow by not having to spend three to five words before every single statement you make saying, okay, out of character, I just want to ask, da 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 or, you know, okay, I want to walk up to him, and in my character, I say, you know, if you can just use your character voice, then, you know, it, it is going to go a long way in, t in improving the flow of the game. Uh, another little, like, tip, another little... Thing I, uh, you know, like if you are confused about whether or not someone is saying something, and it could be interpreted as either like, are they saying this in character or are they saying this out of character? I would err on the side of just assuming they are saying it in character rather than stopping the game and asking, like, so wait, did you mean that in character or out of character? This will like promote the idea that people should either be distinctly talking in or out of character, making that clear. And, you know, it, it can, like, it, it just, you know, promotes the flow. It, it just assume people are saying stuff in character. And, uh, you know, it can also lead to some fun, silly situations and what have you. Okay. So what, what kind of voice should I do? Like, should, like, what, what kind of voices can I get away with? Okay, so this is my tier list for what voices are hard and what voices are not as hard. So this, I think, is the ho hardest type of voice you can do. If you were trying to do the super smart scholar, the super smart wizard, I find normally, like I generally try to talk as intelligently and as eloquently as I can, so to try to go out of my way to use bigger polysyllabic words than I actually use in my day-to-day -day life, it's just, it's, I find it extremely difficult. Now obviously everyone has their own things, their own strengths and weaknesses. This is like definitely my weakness, is just trying to talk with a bunch of words that I don't know. Okay, and the medium. The pronunciation, or pronunciation, uh, trying to do accents and dialects. Now, accents and dialects, I got a few good ones. I can generally do them, but after talking to them for a minute, after just trying to like riff off the top of my head, I, I start to lose it. I start to fall back into my regular voice because accents and dialects are really just like a bunch of these other things like all combined and there's just there's a whole lot of things you need to keep in mind and pay attention for when you're speaking in an accent uh so some terms that might help with like trying to figure out what different accents sound like in different ways uh the glottal glottal t you know do you say uh water or water do you say potato or do you say potato I, you know, it's a little like, oh, okay, and roticity, the rotic R, do you say water, or do you say wa water, do you say farmer, fama, uh, the alveolar, 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 uh, trill, the, do, you, do you roll your R's, or do you flap them, do you tap your R's, R's, hero, this one, if you're trying to do a Scottish accent, you got to get good at tapping your R's. That I find particularly difficult compared to rolling my R's. Uh, so yeah, generally just all this stuff I find like 
try to take words and then pronounce them in a different way, I find generally more difficult than this sort of last thing you can do, which is just straight up change your voice. So your pitch, oh, you can talk like a very high pitched, uh, or you can talk in a low pitch whale sound kind of thing. Uh, and then like the speed, well, this is maybe less so speed at which you talk, but how much space you put between each word. You can talk in a staccato where you separate every syllable very distinctly. Or you can talk in a legato voice where you combine every single word and they all flow together and there's no space in between. Uh, vocal fry. If you want to sound like Steve-O, then don't talk with your vocal cords, but talk with your th throat. And uh, if you need help doing this, then just do whippets every day for a couple of years. Uh, or you can talk in a more valley girl if you slow it down and it still add the vocal fry and give a little bit of off speak and you end things with a rise in your intonation at the end of your sentences. Uh, breathy, this is sort of, I finally, like if you talk in a, if you talk in a whisper, if you're like a guy and you want to do a girl's voice, really talk from the lungs. Do like a whispery voice, but at normal uh, talking volume. Maybe raise the pitch a little bit, but you. It, what the important part is that you're talking, you know, from the lungs, and it's very breathy and airy and light. Uh, or you can do the opposite and talk really from your gut and really talk like you are shouting. Use the same muscles, contract your muscles as though you were shouting, but just bring it all the way back down to normal talking volume. Uh, or you, if you want to be whiny or a coward or a nerd or a Frenchman, you can really contract and talk from the nose up here. Uh, okay. Uh, so these are my different, like... These ones, I would generally like choose one of these things and like just change it from your voice a little bit and just give yourself, like ideally you change it just enough so it's distinct from your regular voice, but not so much that you have difficulty trying to maintain that voice. Uh, okay, the cardinal no-no. So avoid unintentionally interrupting people. I know what you might be thinking, like, how am I going to not, like, unintentionally? Like, obviously, if it's unintentional, then I don't mean to do it. How am I supposed to stop myself from doing that? Well, just like in real life, you really need to listen to people in order to not interrupt them. But in D&D, I find this is, like, exponentially harder. Because, first of all... You know, you interrupt people when they stop talking for a moment and they, like, give an opening for other people to interject. And in D&D, when you both have these thoughts and you're filtering it through the context of what's happening in the game and you're filtering it through the context of how your character might say it and their voice and... So every time you stop to think about things, you have to think about... <sighs> like, what, you, you might, might search, search for the right word, word, search for the right phrase, phrase search, search for the right thought, and it'll take even longer than it does in real life. And as you are thinking of the dialogue, you, I, I find a very common trap that even I still find myself getting stuck in every once in a while, is I will think of what I want to say, I will come up with my perfect ideal you know, like, okay, so I should say this, and like, okay, but it's going to be my character, so I'll add in a little bit of this kind of a spin to it, and it's like, okay, okay, and then, okay, I got it. And then I'm just going to repeat it in my head over and over and over, and then I'm going to wait for an opening, and then as soon as people stop talking, I'm going to blurt it out. And that is really what you want to try to avoid doing at all costs. You really want to try to... Practice active listening. You really want to try to make sure you know when someone has fully completed their thought before you respond with your own thought. Uh, so, you know, you, you are going to have to, like, try to get good at just coming up off the top of your head with how you want to respond in your character's voice and do it in the moment and instantly 
rather than like constantly like writing this dialogue in your head and then waiting for a moment to deliver it. Uh, okay. So how can you help people out from stopping interrupting you? Well, really try to like use intonation to your advantage. Really try to make it obvious when you are done saying with whatever you are trying to say. You know, really, like, make it clear that your statement is over and that it is the uh, turn for someone else to ask or say their thing. You know, so when you're asking a question, you can raise your voice like this. And if you're commanding someone, you know, go do this, sir, yes, sir. You know, really just like intonation, just sharp fall. And, uh, you know, so just like get good with using intonation to help you, uh, like, signify, signify that you are done saying your statement. statement. And, okay. But, like, uh, aren't there people interrupt each other in real life? Like, there is, there must be real reasons to actually interrupt people. And, you know, in, indeed you are. Or indeed there are. It is. Okay. There, like, you, you might be uh, standing up for yourself. Maybe someone else is constantly, like, interrupting you. And then you're going to have this moment where you're like, no, I'm interrupting you. And or if you were like angry or emotional and you want to like get it with the point across and like, no, what I'm feeling, what I care about, this is what's important right now. Don't try to say what your thing is is important. Or if you're talking to a peasant and you're like, oh, just, you cut them off in the middle of what they're saying, like, be gone, dirty peasant. I will not waste words with the likes of you. Uh, now, generally, like, 90% plus of who you're going to be talking to and interacting with is likely going to be your fellow party members. So the likelihood that you end up in any sort of context where this is like a situation that you're dealing with your party members it is unlikely unless you are playing with some like extreme tryhards. Uh, so I would just generally say don't, like, like unless you feel like it's really going to hit hard, I would really, really try to avoid trying to interrupt people. That is, like, this is just an ultimate, like, flow breaker when you have to say, like, oh, sorry, you weren't done. Like, uh, no, yeah, go ahead and continue. That is just, uh, that is, that is not something that will help to preserve the flow, the almighty sacred flow. Okay, so, you know, I'm pretty sure the DM is wrong about something. Should I try to argue with them? The general answer is usually not. Now, if you are a PhD professor in physics and your DM is saying something that wouldn't work with physics, assuming it's not like magic related, it's just straight up carts and barrels of water and yada yada, then, then sure, if you, you want to like clarify, clarify correct, correct the DM, the DM. If, if you think, think that it's just going to be a quick little fix, then go ahead. And if you think this is going to devolve into an argument where everything is going to grind to a halt and it's like, no, we're getting to the bottom of this. We are going to be running a debate team session in the middle of this D&D session. Uh, there, there's like no greater breakage of flow than that and starting like an argument. So like if you are really convinced that you are right, if you are really convinced that this is important, then like go for it. But I would really try to avoid this at all costs. And okay, so like are you certain that this is how a thing would work? Like, if so, then, like, okay, go ahead. You might be you, you might be right in your argument then. Or is this, like, your interpretation of how something is written down and how you think something should work due to, like, the context? And, like, is it's something that is vague that might work the way that you kind of want it to work. That I would probably avoid. Save it till after the session. Consider, like, what is at stake? Is a goblin running away and you want one last extra kill? That doesn't matter. Don't turn that into a 15-minute argument about 
No, I'm pretty sure it has a range of 120 feet. Like, okay, yeah, let's crack open the rule books. Let's figure this out. Let's get to the bottom of this. Uh, you know, if this is like, if someone is going to die, if lives are at stake, if like the future of someone's character and or like the campaign hangs on this decision, then sure, that might be worth figuring out 100% so that everyone knows like, okay, yeah, like that's what the rules say. Like this is what happens in that situation. And okay, if you think it's inconsistent, something that has happened in this world, again, I would go back. What's at stake? Does this really matter? Is this worth arguing about? Now, how about you think your interpretation of something would be more narratively and satisfying, lead to more player enjoyment? Okay, yeah, then maybe your argument is worth it. Uh, you know, and again, so like if you have like multiple of these things, if you like really think it matters, then go ahead. I would generally just like stay away from trying to argue at you know, like whatever you can do to stay away from arguing and preserve the flow. Uh, okay, so yeah, generally just don't argue. Uh, okay, write that down, write that down. The art of note-taking. So everyone has got, uh, you know, everyone has their own needs when it comes to notes. Some people got that, a beautiful mind, photogenic, photographic memory, they know everything about everything uh, once they hear it once. And like, okay, if that's you, then perfect. You don't have to bother writing down any notes. If you've got a normal, you know, good old fashioned, uh, a neuro non divergent brain or whatever you call it, I would highly, highly recommend notes. So I split my notes up into two categories. I've got the group notes and my individual notes. So group notes are things that everyone in the group should know. You should write down what is everyone else's character's name? What class are they? What race are they? What's their general premise? Are they an ex-guard captain? Are they a freed prisoner? You know, write, write down like two to five words for each other character and their character's names. You should know, like, the region or realm or the name of what general area you guys are in. And if there's anyone really important, you should, like, write that down. Like, generally, if a proper noun, something with a specific name, comes up more than twice, like, if you hear any given name three times, that's a pretty strong indicator that it is going to come up even more than that and that you should write it down. And otherwise, you know, at the beginning, it's not going to be that hard to follow. You know, there's just going to be a few names here and there. By the end, there's going to be so, so many different names of just flying around that you, it's going to be like a late season, late episode of Game of Thrones where you're like, who is this? What is going on? You know, so this is just straight up pragmatic, straight up practical. You need to, like, if you want to be able what is going on towards the end of the campaign, like, you are going to have to be keeping track of names and, like, what is who and what is what and, like, what means who and all that stuff. Okay, so the individual notes. This, this might just seem like a little innocuous one line of text on a single slide, but in reality, this is the true meat and gravy. This is what separates D&D &D from video games. This is, like, so incredibly important. You, like, you, you can't even imagine it. Okay, so individual notes. First of all, so anything that just refers specifically to you you should write it down here. You know, if you have any brothers and sisters, whenever something gets added to your background, whenever you want to add something to your background, write it down here. And the, the most important part, whenever you just see stuff you like, whenever there is a character 
that you want to see more of because he has a silly voice or he has a silly hat or he has a silly premise. And you're like, I like this guy. I want to see more of him. Write that guy down. And then in the future, at some point, your DM will say to you, like, okay, you guys have like a week. What is everyone going to be up to? What do you guys want to do? If you don't have anything written down here, you are likely going to like panic and just try to think of the first thing that comes to your head and just say like, uh, well, I'm a wizard, so I guess I am reading books. This is really not ideal. You see, like where the true beauty of D&D comes in is when you can say like, oh, okay, uh, so I've got a week to go do whatever I want. Like, well, remember old Dan, the crazy fisherman? You know, I want to go on a fishing trip with him. And or, you know, okay, oh yeah, you know that historical event you were talking about a little while ago? I want to go do research on that. You know, just pick stuff that you like and just when the, you know, ball is in your court, when you were just asked to like, okay, like you have nothing in particular going on, there's no direct situation, you can choose the situation you want to be in, these notes are going to be you know, they're going to be extremely important and really it is going to elevate the game for for your character and, you know, probably for everyone else, too. Uh, you know, so like Fallout, Skyrim or whatever, you might find the ghoul who you think like, oh man, this guy's like the coolest guy in the world. Like, I just wish the whole game was about this character. Like... You know, but uh, he's just got one side quest, and then he's done, and then you're like, all right, I guess it's on back onto this main quest that I just don't care about. This is the beauty of D and D. If you meet that ghoul, and you're like, oh yeah, this is the coolest guy in the world. I wish this game was just about this guy. Like that's what the game will become about. If you just hang around with that guy, and you just like help him out with stuff, and you just do the things that he needs doing. Then, like, great, you, you can just make the game about that guy for as long as you want. And then once you get bored of him, you pick a new guy for the game to be about. So, yeah, this, extremely, extremely important. Just write stuff down that you like. And then you will have this huge word bank, this huge glossary of things you can just riff off of and play from whenever you've got the opportunity to just riff and play off of whatever you want. Uh, okay. So, <sighs> phones. There's no good, easy way to talk about this without sounding like a middle school teacher. And it's extremely awkward because, obviously, you guys are all doing this as a means to hang out with your friends and just have fun and to end up in this situation where you're like trying to tell people to not look at their phones. It's just, uh, it is a situation to be like avoided. So really like, you know, everyone here is an adult and you can do whatever you want and we're here to have fun. Like if you want to look at your phone, I'm not going to stop you. Obviously go ahead, look at your phone. This right here, this is my scale of how salty and bitter I will get if you are like looking at your phone. So okay, so if you get like a phone call or if you have some important thing, you invested $300 into your, of your college, son's college fund and you're like, oh dear God, I need to check, you know, fidelity every five minutes or else my life is going to like go down the drain and I, I'm pretending to be a day trader and dear God almighty, what am I doing? And or if you get a phone call, like, all right, obviously it would be hypocritical of me to say, don't answer it because if I got a phone call as a DM, I'm going to answer it, you know, just take care of it, do whatever you need to do. And then, you know, try to, try to get back in the game as seamlessly as possible. Okay, what if I like, I'm just straight up, I'm not in the scene. It wouldn't even make sense for my character to know what's going on because I'm literally, my character's not even there. This one, very justifiable. I 100% get why someone 
would do this, and I've been in this situation before where, like, you're not in a scene, and one minute turns into five minutes, and five minutes turns into ten minutes, and then ten minutes turns into tens of minutes, and you're just sitting there, and, like, nothing is happening, and it's not entertaining, and you're bored, and you just want to, like, do something, and you're just going to pull out your phone and start looking at it. Like, very justifiable, very understandable. It is not ideal. I would prefer to at least pretend, at least as the DM, be able to pretend that you care about the game and are being entertained by what these fellow, what your fellow friends, this story that they're coming up with in this moment. I would rather you not be, like, unintentionally saying, like, this is dumb and boring and TikTok and Vine and Angry Birds is way more fun and way more entertaining than this nonsense that they're going through. Uh, you know, I, I would at least like to pretend that, like, you're trying to figure out what you want to do when it comes back to you and or you're being entertained by what they are going on with but like at the end of the day like i get it like i've, I've definitely been there okay what if i'm actively in my in a combat you know we're fighting a troll but i just took my turn and i know there's going to be five other people plus the troll is going to go and if they're going to each take like a minute then there's going to be like at least five minutes before it comes back to me like, I don't want to have to sit here and just wait and watch and re like, just, you know, watch you guys do math for five minutes. That's boring. This one, if you are actively in the scene, and uh, this is where I start to, like, really prefer that you, like, see what's going on. Because every once in a while, we'll end up in a situation where you are watching back at it at Krispy Kreme. And then, you know, when it's your turn again, either you need, like, a moment to, like, figure out what's going on and or you make a decision and then act on it. And then afterwards you find out, like, wait a second, the wizard was at 1 HP? Like, if I knew that, then I would have just run over there and protected him. I wouldn't have hit the troll. Uh, but, like, with this, at least you're not entirely disrupting the game. At least you're not breaking flow if you're like just letting down your team to some extent because you're distracted then whatever that's up to your team to get mad at you and that's not up to me to get mad at you okay and now this next one this is where i start to get salty and bitter this is if you start to disrupt the flow if you break the flow of the game because you'd rather be watching vines and playing crash the castle or whatever if you start asking questions like, huh, who, what, me, poison breath, since, from where, since when was that a thing? You know, my immediate response when something like this happens as a DM is to say, like, yeah, forget it. Like, don't make a constitution saving throw. Like, you're just dead. Like, go ahead, finish your, watch every single vine in the world. Uh, and I know, like, obviously I don't ever actually do that. I'm like, okay, no, constitution saving throw, poison breath from the dragon. Um, you know, so, so this one, this is where I actually start to, like, uh, start to feel some kind of way. This is where I actually start to, like, be disappointed. Uh, and then this one, this, this, like, makes me mad. This, like, if you start taking your disengagement and if you start to distract another engaged player, if you reach over with your phone and tell them, like, Oh, check out this, uh, you gotta see this vine on World Star. That's like, you know, that's territory for me to just want to like flip over the table and start whipping heathens and saying my, you've turned my house of prayer into a house of sin. Like this, this actually starts making me mad when, when that happens. Uh, but like, uh, you know, just cause like, Come on, like, yeah, the DM, he puts in so much work, just, just entertain him, just, you know, just humor him, yeah, like, you, you've got so much time to watch Vines and play Angry Birds, like, you, you don't have to, like, sit at the table and do that, 
And so I know what you're thinking. But Jill, I've got severe ADHD, and I didn't take my 12, you know, uh... What do you take for ADHD, Ritalin or Adderall or something? Okay. And, you know, I'm, I'm addicted to my phone, and I need to watch a Vine every single two minutes or else my heart will stop and I'll die. Uh, to that I say, every single person in the world, if you grew up with phones and TVs, has ADHD. So, like, show me with someone who doesn't have ADHD or doesn't claim to have ADHD, then I'll be impressed. Uh... Okay, so yeah, but, but either way, way, you need something to keep yourself occupied. You can't just sit here and watch this horrible attempt at improv theater for 20 minutes. Like, there's no worse torture than sitting through that. Fair enough. I, like, I get what you're going through. Uh, I guess ideally, if you can focus, try to turn this focus and, like, need to do something towards, uh, like, something game-related... If the DM has handouts that he's given people, or, you know, there's probably a 300-pound, uh, like, rule book for you to flip through on the table, and or if you want to look through the notes, maybe get an idea for something when it comes back to your turn. Uh, like this, I, I would much, much prefer that you distract yourself with something I can pretend is, like, game-related rather than just straight up saying like yeah vine and angry birds is so much more entertaining than this horrible attempt at pretending to be elves and dwarves that you guys are trying to pull off uh so general story like i generally prefer don't look at your phone but i get it we live in a modern world and people are going to do it so just uh, try to dial it back if, if you are in a moment where you feel like I'm bored and I want to look at my phone. Okay. So the platinum rule. All right, you get out what you put in. Okay, so there's this thing called the golden rule. That uh, is both applicable to, like, all of life and to d and in particular. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And that's a generally pretty good rule. It's got, like, a little bit of, like, a hammer uh, like, not 100% perfect all the time because, you know, justice sometimes is more nuanced and complicated than treating everyone exactly 100% the same. Sometimes some people like things that other people don't like, and then this golden rule starts to, like, fall apart in these more complicated situations. But generally, pretty good rule. The Splatinum rule, though, I think is even better than the Golden rule. This is, like, and this is uh, true for all of life. You get out what you put in. It's also true for specific hobbies within life. Uh, but, like, in d and I think, like, within every single moment of the game, this is, like, true and applicable. Like, uh, you, like, you get out what you put in. If you put two seconds of thought into a scene, into something you want to do, you just say, like, I go to the tavern. You'll likely get, like, two seconds worth of satisfaction out of that scene once it is seen through. And, or alternatively, like, how much of yourself are you willing to, like, emotionally invest into your character? If you are... Like, if, if you just simply refuse to care what happens to your character, if, you, like, anything could happen and you don't care, then it doesn't matter what happens. Your character could become God on Earth and have everything he could ever want and have a million wishes, and that would be the exact same as if he went to hell and suffered eternal damnation and torture forever. Because if you just... Don't, don't care, care. It, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. You, you you just you have, have to force yourself to care. And, and like there, there will never be a magical thing that the DM can do to make you care about your character. Like, like he, he can, can try to do things to make your character care about the world, but there's nothing he can do to make you care about your character. That is entirely up to you. And so, yeah, so if you want things to matter, 
you, you know, know you, you have to care. care. Okay. okay. So, so yeah, platinum, platinum rule. Is, is, like, just don't, don't ever forget this. this. You get out what you put in. Uh, like both on the tiniest of scales and within the grandest of scales in D&D. Okay. And we're in conclusion. We're at the end. All right. Never, ever give up. The first couple of sessions are pretty much guaranteed to be weird and awkward and uncomfortable. And uh, when it comes to this, just try to remember you are a flesh automaton animated by neurotransmitters. You know, you are a biological pattern recognition machine. Like, you just, first couple of sessions, try to pick up on, like, just throw everything out there. Just try anything and everything. And sometimes people will respond well to it. Everyone is going to, like, laugh and smile, and they're going to engage with the thing that you are doing. They're going to be fans of it. And, you know, they, they are going to react, and you will be able to tell, like, oh, okay, so they like this thing. Do more of that. Like, keep doing that in the future. Clearly, that is a thing that works. And sometimes the opposite will happen. Sometimes you will do a thing, and the I'm talking about the players, not their characters. The players will get frustrated and annoyed and upset, and or they'll be bored by what you're trying to do. And if you see them reacting like that, don't do that anymore stop doing that thing you know and at the beginning there is no way to know what they will like and what they won't like you just will have to throw everything out there and just try stuff until you figure out the things they do like and the things that they don't like okay and just remember this is core to every single action you take ask yourself like if I perform this action, if I say this thing, both in character and out of character, will this promote flow? Will this lead to someone else doing another thing? Will this lead to me doing something else? Will this lead to this scene going somewhere? Will this lead to the story continuing? Or what am I about to say is going to lead to everything grinding to a halt and us having to figure stuff out and explain stuff to each other? And or like, you know, generally everything out of game is like an instant flow breaker. So I would try to like avoid that stuff as much as possible. But yeah, just remember, grind it into your head. The flow must flow. Everything is about flow. Everything is about things going from one scene to the next. You know, just constantly think like, like if you have to put yourself in that flow chart mentality like if i do this thing will it result in the game continuing or is it going to result in everyone sitting around and waiting and not doing anything okay so that's my general big conclusion and uh, like general tutorial for ex extreme like way way too much uh for a beginner player like you don't have to know any of this stuff this is way too specific way too detailed really probably more than you will ever 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 need don't worry about all this nonsense that i said just try your best and do whatever you think is fun and what everyone else at the table thinks is fun that's really all it actually comes down to uh okay so goodbye